just to briefly on propensity score estimation, so those of you um, from more the treatment effects literature side know that propensity scores are incredibly widely used. Um, they're actually really widely used across all disciplines. And there's a, there's a subset of machine learning that also uses propensity scores and uses propensity score weighting and, um, and, and so on. And so, uh, but, the, but actually nobody has yet answered the question of exactly what's the best way to do propensity score weighting for the purpose of using it in a causal model. So we know a lot about the best methods for minimizing mean squared error of a prediction, but we, we want to think more about what the properties are if it's going to be used as a component of a second stage estimation. And that, as far as I know, is an open question. Okay. Um, so uh, now let's talk a little bit about using machine learning for model specification um, if we're doing causal inference, but we have a selection on observable setting. So that's the setting where conditional on all my covariates, my treatment variable is exogenous. Okay? And that's usually what we're kind of the people who, you know, we run OLS, we're sort of hoping that by sticking a lot of X's on the right-hand side, our treatment variable is, uh, is exogenous. Okay? So um, Victor and co-authors have a very nice discussion in the Journal of Economic Perspective that um, is, is, I think, a great example of why we, it's not enough to listen to the first two hours of these lectures and go home and just run lasso. Okay? Because it actually matters whether you're trying to do causal estimation or just do prediction. And so if we were naive and we just went home from the first two hours and went to catch our plane, um, you know, then you would miss this to say, I'm just going to run. I think I have a selection on observable setting. Now it's even better. I'm going to throw in even more x's, and I'll let Lasso tell me which x's should be in, and I should be done. And so, as Victor points out, the problem is that if, in, and, and in that setting, of course, you're going to force your treatment effect in. So you're not going to take the chance of having that go away. If some, co some covariates are going to have coefficients that are forced to zero, the treatment effect coefficient will then pick up those effects and will thus be biased. Okay? So they, they say there's actually a better approach, which is not something you ever would have thought of if you were just doing prediction. Um, you need to do variable selection via lasso in a selection equation and an outcome equation separately. So we, for IV, we always do two-stage estimation. For selection on observables, we usually don't. We just control for stuff on the right-hand side, control for our, our x's. Um, he's saying, actually, we need to estimate a selection equation even in the selection on observables case. Um, because, and then, so any variables that were important for predicting your treatment, which means they're correlated for your treatment, those should be in the right-hand side as well. So it's not the outcome equation that tells you what x's solve your selection on observable problem. Lasso was not intended to solve a selection on observable problem. Lasso was intended to solve a prediction problem. So just throwing everything into Lasso, you shouldn't hope that it's going to really do a good job solving your selection on observable problem. To solve that problem, you regress your treatment on the covariates. And that's the regression that's going to tell you what variables are important for solving your selection on observables problem. So you want to have both on your right-hand side, things that are important for predicting your y and things that are important for predicting your w. And that's a better way to do it. And so this is, and so this insight's so simple, you can write it up in JEP. So I would say, like, in some of this, if you want to show it to your students as, like, why you don't take machine learning off the shelf, this is a great thing to read. And so he shows uh, just how you get different answers. You get biased answers if you do the single selection. This is bad. That's good. Okay. Um, now we can talk about using machine learning for the first stage of IV. And actually, I gave a talk at Harvard a couple months ago in a department seminar. And surprisingly enough, like, I had a whole morning full of student meetings of people trying to use ML um, in economics. And a couple of them had papers on, on, on this topic. Um, the, the first stage, you know, IV is an economics problem, not a machine learning problem, and they're trying to use, um, use a machine learning for the first stage regression. And Chernozikov and Hansen already have a couple of papers about that. And again, for, in the spirit of being able to use these techniques and not worry about getting your paper rejected, you can cite lovely theorems in Econometrica that uh, tell you it's all OK. You can do lasso on your first stage, and you can do um, OLS on your second stage and report your standard errors. And it's all good. Okay? Maybe not quite all good. I mean, there's some conditions and so on. But again, you know, hopefully nobody will read those. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so, uh, so you know, for future um, for future discussion, you know, maybe we should move beyond lasso. So lasso is nice because it's familiar, but maybe there's other things that that perform better um, that might, but also preserve interpretability. So. As, as Hito mentioned, some of the other methods, people haven't really focused on their asymptotic properties, so, uh, so we just don't really know if, if we can get good results about other things. And so when economists want to actually do hypothesis tests and report standard errors, there's still some more work to do to figure out what the best performing methods are. Okay. Now I'm going to go through a paper that Hito and I are working on, and that's available on the web, um, that looks at heterogeneous effects. And again, I'm going to go through this in some detail, both because I think everybody should use it, but also because I actually want to use it as an illustration for two things. First of all, it's just going to kind of help you get comfortable with all the components of a machine learning model, the in-sample fitting, the out-of-sample cross-validation. And I'm going to change those things. So it's going to help you understand what their roles are because I'm going to change them. But then maybe you'll see that they're actually changeable. Um, and so we, we can think about modifying methods. And it's really not that hard. Okay. So the first motivation is this concern about ex post data mining. So you know, uh, Michael Kramer told me the story about this um, norovirus treatment. In the pre-analysis treatment plan that they filed, they did not. They said they were going to look for um, the effect of the drug, but they failed to say that they were going to look for the effect of the drug on people with the most severe diarrhea. Um, it is not. It is against FDA policy to look at your data after the experiment, find the group for whom it worked, and then ex post make recommendations to use the drug. So a bunch of people are dying um, because they didn't specify the correct pre-analysis plan. On the other hand, you know, experimental economists and, and various folks in the treatment effect literature are actually trying to push everybody should file their pre-analysis plans before they do field experiments. So we should be more like the FDA. Why are they saying that? Well, gosh, if I run an experiment, I'm going to find some group, 67 to 68-year-olds in Alabama. My drug looked great, so let's recommend it for them. And of course, we all, that's bad data mining. Now, data mining is a good word. We say it, you know, our deans love us. But you know, among ourselves, we always thought data mining was bad. And what we, what we meant by that was like searching out for, for obscure things in our data and pretending that they're a real effect. So what we're going to do is propose a machine learning method that will allow you to systematically evaluate the results of a large-scale randomized trial, find those groups, and get correct standard errors about their effects. So I could go back, and actually some drug companies have already asked me to do this, um, you know, to go back and look at their large-scale data and find the groups for whom their drug really worked. So then they could um, try to, they, then they'd still have to do a new experiment, but at least they could do it in a cost-effective way to get their drugs approved. But ultimately, you could do this um, and you could change FDA policy. Um, the, the second thing is that uh, we want to think about um, treatment effect heterogeneity for policy. So like, I might like to understand the structural form of the function. The drug works really well for these people, not so well for these people. Later on, if the cost falls, I might give it to more people. So I just want to know that structural function so I can make optimal decisions. So I just want to say there's, there's sort of two very closely related problems. First of all is estimating the treatment effect as a function of your covariates. Like I want to know how well does aspirin help you. If you tell me your covariates, I'm going to give you a treatment effect. There's a very closely related problem, which is optimal policy. I'm going to tell you if you should take an aspirin. Um, if the costs are zero, in some sense, those are the same thing. If in some applications, there's a benefit function that we're going to measure, and the cost might change later, or a cost function, and the benefit might change later, whatever. So we want to just estimate that structural function and get the magnitudes right. So I'm going to focus on that first. Later on, I'm going to show you can modify these techniques just a little bit to compute optimal policies as well. And it's a slightly different method, but very closely related. Okay. So just a preview, we're going to distinguish between causal effects and attributes. We're going to estimate treatment effect heterogeneity. The, the methodological contribution is that we're going to have different cross-validation approaches than are conventionally used in the literature um, on prediction because we're estimating a causal effect and that's what we want to cross-validate. And we're, we're also going to enable inference. Um, and we're going to use trees, and, I'm, and I hope I'm going to convince you out of this as well, that using trees to segment models is a great thing to do. I love it. Um, uh, and I was doing this long before we wrote the paper. I just didn't have a, a theoretical justification. So we've already talked about regression trees. It's just partitioning a covariate space for prediction. Um, let me now uh, summarize on a single slide what Hito said before. There's kind of three components of these models, and these are the three components I'm going to change. So when you do estimation with a tree, the estimator itself 
is going to be the sample mean of your outcome within a leaf. Okay, so just like a kernel is a weighted average of nearby units or a nearest neighbor matching is like the near neighbor. Well, here the estimator of a tree is just going to be the sample mean of those guys. So it's a very simple predictor. When I decide whether to split the tree, I'm going to use mean squared error as my criteria. So I'm going to say a good split is something that reduces the mean squared error. I could split by people under 60 and over 60, or under 50 and over 50, or under 40 and over 40. And I'm going to choose among those by finding the thing that minimizes the mean squared error. Finally, out of sample, I'm going to use that exact same criteria. I'm going to use mean squared error as well. Now I'm going to compare my prediction to the actual outcome out of sample. Okay, that, so those are the components of the model. And in some sense, if you want to change this model, you can twiddle with those things. And so I'm going to suggest that economists should be twiddling with all of these things. We're going to use trees to divide up my covariate space. I'm going to estimate something different. I'm going to, I'm going to choose different ways to split, and I'm going to use different ways to cross-validate. I'm going to show you one, but there are lots of them that you could do. Okay. So if I wanted to use regression trees to estimate causal effects, um, again, just to, to, to say what am I trying to do, I can say there's a mean function, which is your expected outcome as a function of your treatment and your, your attributes. The treatment effect is the average difference in outcomes for being treated and not treated as a function of your covariates. This is the effect of an aspirin as a function of your age and, and medical history. Okay? If I wanted to just go off the shelf to use machine learning methods to do this, there's a few obvious things you would do. And it turns out a whole bunch of people have done these obvious things. Okay? So what are the obvious things? Well, not a whole bunch. There's a very small literature in machine learning that cares about this, but the, those people who have have done these, these things. So first of all, you could analyze the two groups separately. I'll take my treatment group, and I'll build a big tree, and I'll see how your health outcomes are determined by your covariates. I can do that for the control group. So I have two estimators, two separate estimators, and I can take the difference. Okay? So that works. Um, but the, remember that what these models are all trying to do is make the very most efficient use of your data. You're going to keep adding parameters until you can't add them anymore. And so if you add them to do one thing, you can't add them to do something else. Right? You're gonna, and so the, what this is going to do is use up all your degrees of freedom predicting your, the level of your health, but it's not going to use them predicting the treatment effect. And if you think about any data set you've ever analyzed, you know, outcomes, whether it's health or height or test scores or whatever, are highly variable as a function of your characteristics. But treatment effects, you know, those, those are <laughs> finding treatment effect heterogeneity is much, much harder. And it's, it's you know, I, we can be tall and we can be short, but the effect of an aspirin may not depend on that. Okay, so, uh, so that's, a, that, that's a, 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 an issue. The second thing you could do is you can say, all right, fine, let's just build one big tree. I'm going to throw in my treatment variable along with all my other x's and treat them exactly the same. And the problem with that is that the, 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 you're, you're still not asking the model to really measure treatment effect heterogeneity specifically. It's still going to build whole parts of the tree explaining things that aren't related to treatment effect. And you're going to have some parts of the covariate space where you don't split on the treatment variable at all. So you're going to have a mechanically zero estimated treatment effect. And that may not be ideal either. So both of these are, are kind of lame. So what you'd like to do is actually, I mean, if we're doing models where we're designing an algorithm to solve a problem, our algorithm should actually solve that problem. And why was this not an obvious problem to solve? Well, we don't actually observe the ground truth for anybody. So um, I don't know how to cross-validate my model. So the first approach we have um, is, a, is a very simple approach. I'm going to criticize this approach in a lot of ways, but I want to start with it because A, it works, um, and B, it's very simple to code. You can run it in like two seconds um, in R. So all you have to do is write one line of code and then run a tree in R. To, one line of code is I'm going to transform my outcome. So let me just explain this really briefly. Um, suppose we have 50-50 randomization. You guys are treated. You're control then I'm going to estimate your treatment effect. This is, you're treated, my estimate of your treatment effect is your health. Okay, so that's my estimate of your treatment effect. And Greg's treatment effect, he's the control group, it's minus your health. Okay, that's my estimate, uh, times two. Okay, uh, so that's a kind of a crazy estimate, pretty high variance, but actually, on average, it's right. Okay, why is it right on average? Well, the expected value of this is just, there's the two here. Half of the people will be treated, half of the people will, will be control. I've got a minus one for the control, so if I add them all up, I'm going to get the expected value of the treatment effect. Okay, so actually, 
with just one person, I can get an unbiased estimate of your treatment effect. It just happens to be very high variance. Okay? And I can do that with, uh, with unequal probabilities, and I can do that with selection on observables by using propensity scores. Okay? So, so this, pro this pr procedure, which again, that's one line of code to transform your outcome, and then one line of code to say R part Y, X1, X2, X3, and boom, you're done. Um, you're going to get an estimate of the treatment effect. So what is the effective thing that we're doing here? After we transform the outcome, my estimator is going to be the sample mean of yi star, my transformed variable within a leaf, which in expectation is equal to the treatment effect, as I just argued. My in-sample goodness of fit will be the mean squared error for this transformed outcome, and the same for my out-of-sample goodness of fit. So basically, it's just the standard algorithm with the transformed variable, so I don't actually have to change any lines of code. OK, so what are some problems with this? Well, um, the, again, the advantage is it's easy to code. The pro but the problems are that actually if I look what happens within the leaf, like say I have 55, 45 within a leaf, then what I'm actually going to do for my estimator is I'm going to take the, 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 the sum of the, the treated people and divide by 0.5 instead of 0.55. So I'm essentially going like, to estimate the treatment effect with a group that doesn't have a 50-50 population, except I'm going to weight them 50-50. So it's bizarro. Like You would never, ever do that if you were writing the code from scratch. You would never estimate a treatment effect and not just average over the number of treated people and the number of controlled people. Um, you know, but but, peop but you, you, wouldn't, it's, it's, you don't really think about it if you're just using an off-the-shelf method. But in fact, it's not the best thing to do. So if we don't mind writing a few lines of code, so the great thing about R is it's open source software. It's just got a little function that says, how do you estimate? And you can just substitute in another function. And so we substitute in another function, which is um, the actual sample average treatment effect instead of this crazy kind of, in a particular sample, wrong estimate, high variance estimate. Then when we do splitting and cross-validation, it's also the case that this very high variance estimator is going of, of the treatment effect is, not, is, is possible to improve upon. So in sample, um, for splitting, there's actually, if you, given that we know by, by construction in sample, we have, an, we have an unbiased estimate of the treatment effect, then we know we're going to have a better predictor if our prediction has a higher variance. So in other words, if I start with all of you and I say your average um, temperature is 98.5, but then I, then I can split between men and women, maybe the men are a little hotter because it's a crowded room, so then I could split. And I would see my, my, the variance of my prediction would go up. I might say the men is, are you know, 99 and the, the women are 98.2. Um, so that increases the variance of my prediction. That's a better predictor. And if you have an unbiased estimator, that's the same as improving mean squared error. So we're going to use that. The variance of the predictor is our in-sample splitting. Then out of sample, we're going to do something that's more exotic. Um, we're going to use matching. We're going to use your nearest neighbor matching. And so to, there's other things you could do. So this could be future research. We, why did we choose nearest neighbor matching? And again, and sometimes the beauty of this literature is you don't have to prove any theorems. So you can just uh, do it. Um, but the, uh, so why, what is it you're looking for in an out-of-sample criteria? Well, the whole reason you're doing out-of-sample cross-validation is that you're worried that you overfit. The, the, these three guys in Alabama had you know, the particular outcomes. And so you're going to create a branch of the tree for them. But that was just spurious uh, epsilons. So what you're trying to do is to test whether you've done that, whether, you're, whether your estimator has gone too far. So you really just need an unbiased estimator out of sample that makes sure that, the, that, that, that what you've done in sample isn't biased. And so using the very nearest neighbor, one match, we're using the single closest nearest neighbor as a match, is going to give us a, an estimator that, that minimizes the, the bias among all matching estimators but it's going to give us uh, an estimate of the treatment effect. And so if you compare, if you've got these two different estimates, one is the yi star, your, your health is, you know, your, your treatment effect is two times your health versus, you know, your health, my, uh, your health minus your health. The advantage of using the matching estimator is if there's any predictable components of, of your health outcomes that depend on your characteristics, the matching estimator controls for that. So the, the variance of the matching estimator is basically like the variance of the treatment effect conditional on x, while the, this yi star doesn't control for any of the, the covariates. And also, the scaling factor, which just averages out when you take the mean, actually you get 1 over p squared when you go to the variance. You multiply by p, and you end up with these crazy terms in the denominator. 
So it actually increases the variance. So, it's a, so it, it, and that can actually make a substantial difference. Um, so we modify the algorithm. We just mo and, and practically, that means we just change a few components, the subroutines of the R code. We're going to use a sample average treatment effect as our estimator. We're going to use the variance of the estimator to decide when to split. And we're going to use the matching estimator. So we're going to essentially estimate our cross-validation criteria. Okay? So it's a kind of a funny thing. Instead of comparing to the ground truth, I'm comparing to an estimate of the ground truth, um, which, again, we haven't really seen. Okay? So these things will be similar if treatment effects, if, if we, I'm sorry, if we compare the causal tree to, say, um, you know, using a, a, a single tree, or a, we're gonna, they're going to be similar if treatment effects and levels are highly correlated. But if things that affect treatment effects aren't the things that affect levels, then the conventional machine learning methods won't do very well. The transformed outcome will do badly if there's a lot of observable heterogeneous outcome because the matching estimator controls for that. And so we do a bunch of simulations, and what we find is, just as you would expect, the trans out transformed outcome trees end up being less complex because when we test to see if they work, we keep thinking they don't work because we have really high variance. And so we say, oh, don't build a complicated tree because every time you try to build, get more complex, you make mistakes. But actually, it's the, the evaluation criteria that's making a mistake, not the, the tree itself. So we find that the causal tree generally does better, although I should say, you can find data, data sets where any of these does best. So there's no single dominant criteria. OK, now let's talk about inference. Again, this is not the subject of the machine learning literature at all. And you might have thought, like I have had many questions when I present this in machine learning audiences. They say, well, how can you talk about doing standard errors when you're doing trees? Because we know that the prediction of a tree is not asymptotically normal. It's not just that we don't know if it is. We know that it's not. Trees are highly discontinuous. But my goal is not to do inference on the prediction. I am using the machine learning method to segment my sample. Just like it's perfectly fine for you to split your sample and run the regression on old people and young people separately, it's perfectly fine for me to build a tree and then estimate treatment effects at the bottom of the tree. I want to do inference on the treatment effects, not on the tree. And Actually, for doing inference on the treatment effects, the tree is actually easier to work with than a continuous model. Because at the end of the day, it's just splitting your sample. And we all know that's fine. So actually, here I would say even, you know, you should be able to publish this too with no problem. Um, we have a, so our paper is not quite accepted yet. We're, we're, it was, it's, it's, we've submitted it to a special issue of PNAS because they had a machine learning special issue that we presented the paper at. So we, hopefully it'll be better when it's published for, getting, for using it. But I think that actually the logic of this is clear enough that you should be able to explain this to your editor. Um, so uh, it shouldn't be any problem. There is, a, there is actually, though, one, one important issue. Um, when I split my tree, I need to, to, to separate the process of building my tree and doing my estimates. Because it is true that if I find, I might still end up with a, 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 a part of the tree that it's, it, I need more than one person to, to mess up the tree because I'm doing cross-validation and so on. But you know, if I have a few people in Alabama who have funny outcomes and then I split on Alabama, on average, the treatment effect within that data set, the same data set that split, is going to be higher than it should be. So when I build the tree and estimate my effects, I, I am going to have biased estimates. And we see that in applications and simulations. But my proposal to you is to use part of your data set to build the tree. And that part of your data set is the one that's going to tell you how to split. And then use the other part of the data set to estimate your effects. And at that point, you can do whatever the hell you want. Your, my, my tree told you to split by state and pick out the south and do old people. And then over here, you don't even have to use the tree to estimate. You, know, you could just put in dummies. You can do other things. And even within the, if you split, if you end up splitting the way the tree suggested, you know, you could run a whole model um, according to those splits. And so that you're really not constrained. Uh, so that's, so that's, that's the idea. And so if you were really mostly wanting to run a model and just wanted to find a few splits, you might use less of your data to estimate the tree and save most of your data to get precise estimates for your models. On the other hand, if you were mostly concerned about finding the heterogeneity and not as concerned about inference, you could do something different. But we just proposed in the paper splitting 50-50. Okay. So let me just give a little application here. Um, so estimating position effects in search. Um, as you know, the, the Google's getting investigated by the European com com Commission, and they admitted in FTC documents that have been made public that they manipulated the search results. They put Google Finance on top and put other things lower. So you can read all about that on the internet. 
Um, the Wall Street Journal leaked the documents. Um, but uh, so here what we did was in a, in a randomized controlled experiment where I actually took a couple million users on Bing and I re-ranked their results to see the causal effect of position. And of course, it's not, it, you, it's easy to look out in the data and say, okay, the thing at the top gets clicked more than the thing in the second position. Um, that's true. So in our data, uh, the thing in the top position gets clicked 25% of the time. The thing in the third position gets clicked 7% of the time. But of course, you know that the position is not exogenous. The whole point of a search engine is to put the best thing on top. So we don't know whether it got clicked a lot because Bing did a really good job or if the position caused people to get clicked a lot. So you can decompose that with a randomized controlled experiment. So when we take the thing in the first position and put it into position three, it turns out that it gets clicked 12% of the time, which is more than the typical 7% for the lousy thing that's usually in the third position. But it's a heck of a lot less than the 25% it would have gotten. So the causal effect of decreasing position is you lose about half your clicks. Okay? Um, so, so you can see that even though you might think that having everything on a web page is not important, that intermediators uh, that rank things actually have a huge impact. But the effect is quite heterogeneous. So we build a tree that's, that, that um, tries to, to see exactly how, what causes the effect to be big or what causes it to be small. And so we can see that um, for celebrity queries that, that, have, uh, that likely to have pictures, uh, the position doesn't matter very much because if you, you know, search for Paris Hilton, then you're just going to click on her picture and you don't really care about the informational links. On the other hand, um, things that are, uh, that are, that are more um, informational, that are coded, say, to be likely to be from, have a Wikipedia reference or so on, there's a, actually a much larger effect of uh, to losing um, uh, a 0.2 click. And so then what we can, what we do, what I've got here is, a, is the, all the leaves, the treatment effects and the standard errors. And there's a treatment sample and the, um, um, the training sample and the test sample. And so the training sample, it turns out, if you do some calculations, has a much higher variance than the test sample. And that's exactly because of this overfitting. Um, the, the, the training sample estimates are biased because I found a leaf exactly because in that particular sample, the treatment effects were more extreme. So then if I take that same tree and go to the test sample, the data that wasn't used to create the tree, I get effects that are more moderate. Okay? But then as you can see, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward to think about reporting this. You can say, look, you know, I've got these exogenous variables. I use this other data set to build a tree. Now I've just segmented my analysis, and they're the standard errors. They're fine. Um, no problem. Okay? So the conclusions, that the key to the approach is to um, we want to distinguish between causal and predictive parts of the model. Um, we want to think about having best of both worlds. So we want, to, we want to combine what we know from the treatment effect literature with what we've got from the machine learning literature to get better um, answers. And I do think, actually, for the randomized controlled trial literature, this could be important, especially. So there's actually, I did, this is just a literature slide. There are a bunch of people who have looked at similar things. Um, a few people actually, it turns out, independently, um, while we were writing the paper, introduced the transformed outcome into LASSO. The same critiques I said of the transformed outcome for the trees also apply if you use them in lasso. Um, and so, uh, so we think there, there are better ways to do it. Okay. Um, we actually also apply it to instrumental variables. Um, doing, now we're going to build a tree where we have two components, a numerator and denominator, and estimate them separately. I'm going to skip that. Um, I think about you know, some other next steps. Once you kind of see this general idea, um, you actually could think about estimating a demand model at the bottom of the tree and doing various other things. And really, that, that was actually my original motivation, estimating elasticities. And I talked to people at eBay and Amazon who also agreed that this was a really common problem. Um, and a lot of the other economists who had been looking at this data were also struggling with the same issues. Um, okay, so let me just, uh, we just have a few minutes left. Uh, let, me, let me move on. Let's see how much we have. We've got about 20 minutes. Okay. I want to talk now about optimal decision policies. And as I said, this is a very closely linked problem. If I know your treatment effect is a function of your covariates, I also have, a, have some ideas about what um, policy I should assign to you. But it turns out that you know, the loss function from estimating a treatment effect is a little bit different than the loss function from estimating an optimal policy because I'm trying to, if I just want to get the right answer, I don't care about the magnitudes in the same way. So mean squared error isn't the right criteria. It's more of a classification error problem. Um, I should also say that you know, the context may govern which one you're interested in. 
So in the health study, I think I want to estimate the average treatment effect. But if I'm you know, Amazon and I'm making online recommendations, or if I'm a web page and I'm trying to decide you know, what news to, to show you or what content to show you, then I, I sort of like, I'm, all I care about is the environment today. I don't care about the environment in the future. I don't care about under, under, an underlying parameter. I just want to make good decisions now. Um, and so I think whatever I'm measuring is kind of the full cost benefit um, analysis. And so I know, I, I'm not really going to care or save the magnitude of the treatment effect. I just want to basically give you the right, the right thing. So examples are offers and marketing, web page optimization, customized prices, et cetera. Um, so same old model. Um, we're going to maintain the selection on observables uh, assumption. Um, and so now we can just say there's an optimal policy, which the notation isn't perfectly ideal. I, I, my, maybe I should have called this W star of x, but pi star of x is the optimal w given, um, the optimal w given your x's. And I should say that this, this problem also gets more interesting when it's more than a binary choice. I'm going to show you the math mostly for binary choices, but it, it, it's more general. Okay. So there actually is a small literature in machine learning that tackles exactly this problem. And, and it was, it's kind of interesting um, you know, it's, it, that they've gotten there before economists in some sense. So I should, I, we've said, said all this stuff about how they don't care about um, you know, decision making, and we do. But for this specific problem, uh, they actually have been working on it um, for some time. And it, and it does have a, a close link to what I just described. So there's about 10 different names for this problem, uh, contextual bandits, partial label problem, all sorts of names. Um, so what they do is they apply another literature called cost-sensitive classification. So all of the classifier models can also be run weighting classification error. So you can, put a, you can say some errors are bigger than others. That was how it was originally motivated. Um, but generally, you're just going to weight observations. And so the pol actually, this got cut off a little bit. The policy problem is to minimize the regret from a suboptimal policy. So again, it's a little bit different than mean squared error. Close, but not the same. You want to minimize the, the, the mistakes, and some mistakes are more costly than others. So there's a, for the two-choice case, it turns out there's this really cool result they have that makes it very easy to solve the personalized medicine problem or the personalized offer problem. So the basic thing is I'm going to transform the outcome, similar to what I did before. And I, so I'm going to, if there's a propensity score, I'm going to divide by the propensity score. It's a 50-50 experiment. That doesn't matter. Um, so just pretend for a second it's 50-50 experiment and ignore that part. I'm going to train the classifier as if the, observation, the, the observed treatment is optimal. So I'm going to do a 50-50 experiment. I'm going to assign you aspirin randomly. And then I'm going to get an optimal policy by doing a discrete choice model that predicts as if that was an optimal choice. Seems a little counterintuitive at first, doesn't it? OK, the reason it's, it's right is that, well, I'm not exactly going to do that. I'm going to weight you by your outcome. So if you happen to be assigned an aspirin and you had a really good health outcome, you're going to be weighted really heavily in saying that, that your X's should predict a 1. If you had a really lousy health outcome, you're going to be weighted only a little bit in predicting whether your X's should get you an aspirin. OK, and so there's actually, so you might think this is OK approximately. But so um, the loss from a cost-weighted classifier that's doing misclassification error minimization is actually exactly the same in expectation as the policy regret. So in principle, just like I said before, you can transform your outcome, do weighted, th weighted minimization, and just throw it into an R routine. And out will pop the optimal aspirin policy for all people as a function of their covariance. So you can do personalized medicine in two lines of code. Brilliant. Um, and so, so, th so that's very nice. But actually, in some sense, that literature stopped a little too soon. They got very excited about that, that they could use these off-the-shelf methods. But they didn't actually ask whether these were the most effective methods in practice. And it turned out all the critiques we had of the transformed outcome for the heterogeneous effect also apply here. It's just a little less obvious. Um, but you just have to do a little algebra to figure it out. And actually, I don't know how excited you guys are about algebra at this late hour. Maybe I'll. Maybe I'll give just a little bit of it, because I think it's, it kind of helps you understand how they work and also how the classifiers work. So if I, when I'm going to compare two policies, so I suppose I estimate two classifiers. Maybe one has a, a variable in it, and one doesn't have it, or something. One, a more complicated tree and a less complicated tree. I want to compare them and see which ones do better. 
So I'm going to compare the classification error. So of course, any place where these two classifiers agree, there, there's no difference in classification error. So there's only two regions that matter for comparing the classifiers. The region where a classifier A says treat and B says no treat, and the region where A says no treat and B says treat. And those are the only two regions that matter for comparing two classifiers. So in this method, if in the region where A says to treat, the loss function A has no misclassification error for the treated units um, because we're assuming those were optimal. So on the other hand, for the control units, classifier A does have a loss, and it's equal to the expected outcomes of the control units, the average outcome from the, from the control units. For the, for the classifier B, B says don't treat, but these were the units who were actually treated, so I'm going to have I, I, the negative, the classification error is that I didn't treat them, so we're gonna, the, the classification error will be the negative of their outcome. And so if I add all of this up, in expectation, the loss function of the classification error is the expected value of the negative of the expected value of the treatment effect for the region, for the first region, and the positive of it for the second region. And again, these are the differences between A and B. Okay? So, so, so these are the objects. But of course, in some sense, if, like, if this is what you're trying to estimate, again, these objects are very high variance. And so what we would suggest to do instead is to estimate just using the treatment effects, and let's use a matching estimator um, to, or it, out of sample or in sample, let's use the, the sample average treatment effect. So let's, let's, let's not make the stupid mistake of pretending that we're 50-50 when we're 55-45, basically. Um, and that seems like it's a simple correction, but it can make a difference in practice. Um, and so here I just put them both side by side, but let me move past that. So, so this slide is just saying we're going to use matching for, cl for cross-validation. Um, and so for inference, actually, again, this isn't considered in the machine learning literature, um, but it, the, the, the same discussion holds as before. As before, we're going to split the sample. We're going to estimate the classification tree on one part, and then I can do inference on whether I've got the optimal policy on the other part. So just summing up, um, there is actually this existing machine learning literature that, that says as a function of your covariates, should you get a drug, should you get an offer, should you get a voting mailing, whatever. Um, what we will, and so you can apply that, and it works. But we can do better um, with, by improving it for the purpose at hand and customizing it. I mentioned that this, for multiple treatment options, what they suggest to do is to do a combination of binary classifiers. So you take all your data, you, you um, take, uh, you, you, you run option one versus two, three versus four, five versus six, and then you go region by region of the data and you run a horse race of the winners, and then you run a horse race of the winners until you've got an optimal policy. And so they show that that actually uh, is better in terms of prediction than trying to do them all at once. So other related topics, um, the machine learning literature, actually the, the directions they've gone that are more interesting for them is trying to do this online. So actually those I.O. people might remember like two years ago, I actually brought in John Langford and he was supposed to tell everybody about machine learning. What he did was he actually like opened up his computer, went to a prompt, ran, typed in a command and all these numbers went through the screen and he said, I just learned, you know, I forget what he was predicting. Like I just did this right now. And everybody's like, what did you just do? <laughs> And no idea, but what he was trying to show everybody was that he had such a fast learner, it could read in data in real time and make very complicated predictions very fast. And so everybody at the I.O. was like, why would I want to do that? But if you're running a website, you absolutely want to do that. That's really cool. Um, and so some other directions, actually I was just chatting with Alberto about this. There's actually some work in economics about double robust estimation and also this branch of literature has, has thought about that, dealing with problems with propensity scores being too small and so on. Okay. So let me see. I'm going to skip over this. Um, so th here, are, there's a slide about the paper with Alberto and, and Hito. It's an MBR working paper. You can read it. Um, let me say a few words about this paper, some proceedings paper that Hito and I wrote. And here, even more than before, I just want to emphasize, I don't think we have the final answer, but I want to kind of inspire you to think in this direction uh, because I think it's a promising direction. So um, here we want to say, we want to think, now that we've gotten all excited about model selection, 
maybe we should also start thinking about robustness of models. And so the typical thing we all do in all our applied papers is we, we, God gave us our model, and it was decided by economic theory, but just in case we were wrong, here's four more columns that show what happens if we add and take away fixed effects and some other things, and that makes us feel better. And then what makes us feel really good is if the beta coefficient is the same in each of the five columns. That's awesome. Okay, now which hundred columns we didn't put in, <laughs> you know, is a little unclear. And also, of course, the way we got to that pretty table where the coefficients were stable was by taking stuff in and out earlier on and seeing where we weren't robust, right? So that process um, is unsystematic. Uh, it's not that we're trying to be bad. Uh, we're trying to be good. We're trying to, to tell the reader how robust we are, but it's awfully unsystematic. And it just goes to hell if you have hundreds of covariates. So I'd like to be more, more uh, systematic about robustness. And so I'm going to now be inspired, so you can like it or not like it, I'm going to be inspired by the engineering approach of my machine learning colleagues. They don't let the fact that this is hard stop them. They just write something down and see if it works. So I'm going to be a little bit in that spirit. Um, so why have we not done robustness before? You know, it's been pointed out, um, you know, take the con out of econometrics by Ed Lemer. But it never really caught on because we never found a good way to do it. Um, one pro if you say we could be a Bayesian, we should have a prior over models, but what's the prior? It's just hard to, hard to know what to do. So I'm gonna, we're going to propose a, a something that you could do. Um, and could there be something better? Yes. But I'd like to get that, that, that conversation restarted. And what do I think has changed is that now we have lots big, bigger data sets, more data, and we can, be, we can think about being, using machine learning methods to be more systematic. But I should say there's not a direct, I'm not directly applying any machine learning method. It's just inspired by them. So what is our proposed approach? Um, we're going to use a series of tree models to partition the sample by the covariates, the attributes. Simple case, we're going to take each attribute one by one. We're going to re-estimate our model within each partition. And then I'm going to, once I, I'm going to split my sample, estimate my model, and then I'm going to re-average it back up. Okay, so that is a different estimate of my original estimate. I had an original estimate of a parameter for my whole data set. I'm going to get two estimates on different partitions, but I'm not, cons I'm not asking how different are those two estimates. That's heterogeneity. I'm going to average them back up and see what, how, does, how does estimating the model to essentially allow everything to interact with the thing I split on change my overall average effect. Okay, that's going to yield a set of sample average effects. And we're going to propose the standard deviation of the effect as a robustness measure. This thing is, is a problem, and I'm going to talk about the problems with it, but it's a starting point. Okay? And so what are some nice things about this? Well, I'm asking people to do this, but I'm not asking you to write any more code, really, because I'm just, you're going to, whatever your very complicated structural model estimation is, don't change a thing. Just split your sample and run it on a smaller sample. So I'm going to hold everything about how you estimated fixed. I'm not going to tinker inside your code. I'm just going to split your sample and let you re-estimate it. So I think that will make it convenient for people to do, even if they're doing nonlinear structural models. Um, so then we, we apply this method to four applications. When the randomly assigned training program won the non-random Lalonde data, uh, lottery data that had kind of uh, had exogenous assignment of lottery winnings, and one is a straight regression of earnings from NLSY. And so um, what we're going to do first, this is just within the Lalonde data, what we're going to do is we're going to look, the, the base model has an estimate of the treatment effect and a standard error. Um, and this is, the ex, uh, this is the experimental data. The non-experimental data has a similar magnitude treatment effect and a similar standard error. Our robustness metric, however, is very tight for the experimental data and very big for the non-experimental data. So if we go systematically through, the, through the, the covariates, in each case, split the data by the covariate and then combine them again, which again is like allowing interaction effects with each of the variables, essentially, we get a whole bunch of, um, of, uh, of, we get a whole bunch of different estimates. They're tighter for the experimental data. For the non-experimental data, if you had written down this specification, you get negative 4.26. And that's, a, that's perfectly reasonable because you just allowed one more interaction effect in the regression, and suddenly the training program is terrible. Um, so this metric is going to pick that up, and it's going to just provide you some discipline besides the five columns. So, um, oops, I'm, I'm sorry, actually, I shouldn't have used that example. This is the, this is the splitting on the treatment variable. Bad example. Here's the, the, here's the splitting on unemployed in 74 gives you negative 2.44. Sorry about that. Um, okay. 
So then we look at the four examples and we look at our robustness metric and the ratio of the standard error to the robustness metric. It's very low in the experimental data. Um, it's, it's high in the non-experimental data and it's sort of medium for some of these other, uh, these other ideas. And so let me just say again, I, I don't think this is the final word, but I think it's provocative that we, should, we can and, and could be more systematic. So some of the nice things about this is that it's invariant to the scaling of the right-hand side variables. My method is going to decide where to split. So if I take income and multiply it by two or square it or log it, I'm going to get exactly the same robustness metric. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's invariant to um, transforming the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the vector. I'm sorry. The, so, so, the des, so that's a good desiderata. Then there's two desiderata that we fail. If we, if we added interactions or sort of did a matrix multiplication to transform the whole vector, we're, our metric is going through one by one. So it's not considering interactions. And so if I specify differently, I would get a different answer. And the worst problem with it is that if I add in irrelevant variables, then I'm not going to change my answer. Um, and so that's going to kind of uh, uh, sort of allow me to game the robustness metric by putting in a bunch of irrelevant variables. So that's a problem that should be fixed. Um, so the bigger thing is we want to create a class of models. Each model has to be distinct to create variants, but we also want to allow a lot of interactions, which tends to make models more similar. And we want to think about a well-grounded way to weight models. So something we're working on that we haven't actually totally written up yet, and this is kind of a complicated slide, so let me just say a few words uh, kind of verbally about it. We actually want to think about maybe doing worst case analysis instead. So think about a bounds analysis or a set of models and looking at the worst case rather than looking at the standard deviation. And the advantage of looking at bounds is that I can keep throwing in irrelevant models. I can throw as many irrelevant models as I want, and I can't gain my outcome. The disadvantage of this is if I try a whole bunch of different models, some of them are going to be crazy. So you know, these bounds um, you know, may be very sensitive to outliers. So there's actually a fix for that, that it has a whole decision theory. So Tomas uh, Schlecki from MIT, I mean from, Har from Harvard, uh, has a, um, a bunch of work on this, and so does Tom Sargent, about variational preferences um, that basically do worst case analysis, except for if they, if they deem a particular model bad, and I'll say bad, what's bad in a minute, then it doesn't contribute as much to the bounds. So I, I kind of add something back onto it to make it less likely to actually be the bound. So in, in, in Sargent's work, he, he's, he's thinking about macro models, and so he says a model is bad if it's not consistent with the data. Here, my idea is that um, a good model might be one that does a good job in prediction. So I could think of a whole bunch of different models, but if some of them do very badly at predicting outcomes out of sample, then those models shouldn't determine the bounds of my parameter estimates. Now, this works great for like exogenous covariates. It doesn't work very well for IV because we just know, told you that like IV doesn't maximize predictive power. So that's really an open question more broadly for causal models. How you would, how you would say this model is so bad that I don't want it to be entered into my robustness set. But these models are all plausible models and so they should be part of my robustness measure. So I think that's an open question. Um, but uh, anyways, my, I think the, the big takeaway I'd like you to have is that these machine learning methods have really systematic ways to generate models and get the outcomes. And so if we now have another tool for measuring robustness that can systematically search our data, generate different estimates. And the open question is really then, how do I aggregate those up? Do I want to take the standard deviation of them? Do I want to take the bounds? You know, if I take the standard deviation, I have to have some way maybe to throw some of them out that are identical. So I would want to look at different models. So that's one way to go is to say I'm only going to enter different models and I'll take the standard deviation. Another way to go is to say I'm only going to take reasonable models and take the bounds. So this is ongoing work and I, and I hope that, you know, some people get excited about it and, uh, and, and, and work with this. <laughs>